And also, once you have done that, we would like you to go ahead and give us a shout in the Q&A box to let us know how many of these Connects courses you've attended. If this is your first one, um, welcome, and thank you for joining us. So I'll go ahead and take care of some introductions and housekeeping items. My name is Nicole Grimm, and I'm going to be your host today. So again, welcome, and thank you for joining us. For content, we are scheduled for 60 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Speaking of Q&A, we again encourage you to participate throughout the session, so please don't be shy. The Q&A box is going to remain on your screen throughout the presentation. Please type any questions throughout the presentation in that Q&A box. If you have any technical difficulties during the session, you can seek help in this box as well, and one of our team members will help you. Recordings, we'll be sending the recording via email today with CE info, and we'll be posting recordings daily in the Facebook group. Our goal is to offer CE credit for all courses. The evaluation and quiz will be sent today, and your CE certificates will be issued within one to two weeks. Okay, so with that all out of the way, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Doug Young. Dr. Young is a professor emeritus at the University of Pacific, where he is an active educator in the field of minimally invasive dentistry and cardiology. He currently works for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium as a specialist in oral health promotion. He was one of the founders of Canberra Coalition, American Dental Education Association, Curiology Section, and the American Academy of Curiology. He has served on the ADA Council of Scientific Affairs and is currently a member of the ADA Evidence-Based Dentistry Leaders Network and Curiology Consultant for the ADA. He has been published in numerous peer-reviewed dental journals and textbooks. Dr. Young has been an incredible advocate of the Carry Free program, and we are so grateful to have his expertise and partnership. Dr. Cooch is joining the conversation today as well. Dr. Cooch also has a very impressive resume. He is the founder of Carry Free, and we're lucky to have him as our resident Carry's risk management expert. He's newly retired from private practice after 40 plus years, but he's managed to remain as busy as ever with giving back to his dental community and speaking engagements. Dr. Cooch also continues publishing papers and journals. He acts as scientific advisor on dental caries for the prestigious Koi Center in Seattle, Washington, and he's a scientific reviewer for multiple journals, including Data, Compendium, and Inside Dentistry. So the bios I've just read only begin to scratch the surface of what these two have done. Um, Dr. Kutch, would you like to say a few words and officially introduce Dr. Young to us? Yes, Nicole, thank you very much. And uh, I just have to say, uh, welcome, Doug. For those of you who know me or know Doug, know that Doug and I are very good friends. We bonded over uh, dental caries about 20 years ago and have done a lot of work together, published a number of papers together, and have lectured together extensively. So Doug is one of my closest friends, and I am really excited, Doug, to have you here and talk about you've done so much work uh, in minimally invasive dentistry and smart restorations. And I think this whole aerosol topic is one that we need to address as you know dental professionals going forward um, with this pandemic. So. Um, I look forward to your presentation, Doug. Welcome. Thank you, Kim. And um, I wanted to thank um, you and the team as well for putting on this unique program. Um, I never heard of something going every day for 30 days, but if you think about it, it's really a nice way to do it, uh, especially if you can't be in person. So thank you very much. And as Kim said, um, I consider Kim one of my best friends. So if you don't know Kim, I just want to give him some love here because he formed this company to do the right thing for Canberra and for uh, creating products to help us fight this disease of dental caries. And um, his team and the company is just all about that. So uh, congratulations, and, and we want to thank you again from the profession. Anyway. Um, I do have to confess, my title is kind of misleading. 
I don't think there's anything we do in dentistry that doesn't have some type of aerosol. So it's kind of fake news, but I know that you'll get the point. Um, the other thing is I also use this COVID crisis to uh, selfishly point out that we've been trying to do this for almost two decades is to minimize um, surgical treatment um, by treating caries disease, not the lesion. And so um, that's part of my presentation today. So for those of you that um, don't have my email, please take it down. It's at the bottom of the screen because there's some things that you might want to contact me for. It's dyoung at pacific.edu. And with that, um, I have to use the arrow. Uh, my disclosures for today, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, I do a lot of work for the ADA. And I'm very thankful for the ADA because I've learned so much in the process. Uh, but my views today uh, obviously don't represent the ADA in any way. And my consistent financial relationships for speaking in other uh, projects are GC America, Elevate Oracare, and uh, Oral Biotech. And again, uh, thanking the team for putting this on. I do want to take maybe five minutes to talk about my story, the connections of medicine and dentistry, and the common themes that we've heard so far and will hear in the future uh, on this symposium that we're having online. So I want to go back to the idea that both, for example, the uh, multifactorial nature of the disease of caries is very complex. And some people like to simplify it. And sometimes it's just not that easy to do. Same in medicine for something like heart attack or cardiovascular disease. In medicine, people, uh, the physicians get paid to treat the risk factors for heart disease, uh, smoking, overweight, uh, high cholesterol, high, high blood pressure, etc. diet. And in dentistry, we don't seem to get reimbursed for that type of thing. So the economic model of dentistry rewards dentists for drilling teeth or doing procedures versus treating the, the cause of the problem on the teeth, which is the disease itself. And that's where I entered two decades ago, uh, starting um, my studies with John Featherstone and Canberra and trying to treat this disease um, rather than treating the lesion. Now, fast forward to two years ago. I'm in radiology teaching uh, students how to interpret radiographs, and I happen to uh, have them take a panoramic on me. On the panoramic, I identify two bilateral calcified carotid arteries. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. What is this? What does it mean? I knew nothing about it. So long story short, thanks to Kim, he sends me this book, um, Beating the Heart Attack Gene, Beat the Heart Attack Gene by Amy Donin and um, Brad, Bradley Bale, who you heard uh, on the first lecture. And it basically taught me everything that I need to know about how traditional medicine is kind of similar to dentistry in that it doesn't really solve all the problems of a multifactorial disease. For example, um, I went to my physician and said, hey, I found this on my panoramic. What does it mean? What do I do? And no offense to him, I got the traditional answer. Oh, don't worry about it. There are so many people that are walking around with plaque in their arteries that are asymptomatic, and you're on the exact treatment that I recommend. You're on a statin and an aspirin, because I've been on that prophylactically for years, because all the cardiologists seem to be on it, so I did it as well. And so he kind of downplayed it and said, okay, if you want to, go take a stress test, and we'll um, do a calcium score on your heart, and et cetera, et cetera, which I passed with flying colors. My labs were always um, good. 
so I had no clue I had a problem going on. And for years, I was ignorant. I thought that taking a, a statin meant I could eat whatever I want. And as long as I was asymptomatic, that meant I was good. Well, by reading this book and seeing Amy in person, uh, Donine, as a patient, um, she taught me that there's more to it than that, just like dentistry. Um, to do treat the disease of caries, you need a lot of information. So she did a battery of lab tests on me, including genetic testing, and long story short, uh, found where my genetic predispositions were, uh, designed a diet that was uh, equipped to handle how my genetics um, metabolized um, my nutrients, and um, medications and supplements. And so I just, for one, don't like doing anything half-assed. So what I did with my diet is I started with the extreme. I just went vegan. I said, you know, I'm already on these medications. If I'm going to see an effect, I have to, I, I won't know what in my diet is, is causing the problem. So let's just go vegan. So I went vegan. My labs went from normal to way on the good side of normal in fact, past the normal boundaries of, of, of low. And so I knew that the diet had directly related uh, to my disease. Since then, I cheated a little bit, uh, went plant-based, and then went to, Amy wanted me on uh, salmon, and I occasionally eat some of my game meat, which is more healthy. So I'm back, my labs are still exceptional. And so um, I really advise you to listen to Amy on the 22nd, I believe, and, um, you know, buy this book on Amazon for 14 bucks. Now, what's my long story dragging on to the connection to dentistry? This is exactly what we've been trying to do with Canberra over two decades. Teach people the value of treating the disease, and you might have to do more testing and other things that your normal traditional dentist doesn't do, and then um, monitor outcomes. And that's exactly what we want to do with Canberra. So enter today with COVID-19, and we started this week off with, or last week off with uh, Dr. Bale talking about um, um, hypochlorous acid and how you can do that with a saline rinse in, in the nose and sinus area. And I kind of wanted to chime in at this because I've been using um, um, saline rinses forever since I had a um, huge allergy to, like, pollens and so forth. And, you know, just cleaning your nasal passages and sinuses made sense to me. Well, when I had severe attacks of sinus infection, I get that from my allergies, I get it from colds, and when I get it from flu. And trust me, I had pneumonia once from this. It travels from my upper respiratory tract, and it got into my lungs, and I almost died from that pneumonia. So I joke around, but I tell people, if I'm going to die, it's from respiratory disease, because it was terrible. You know, you, you know, you can't imagine, you can't breathe. Uh, my head was exploding because of the temperature. Is terrible. So I take all these precautions not to get any kind of upper respiratory tract infection. So I'm not recommend you do this, but here's what I did. Uh, I started with my nasal rinse, and I took some 2%, 0.2% high um, 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 bleach, which is the hypochlorite, and diluted it into my Neomed bottle, I think it's 240 milliliters. So I took a 0.2 mixture percent, and I put in a few milliliters at a time, and I went up to almost 10 milliliters with no side effect or burning sensation. So I started using that when I got symptomatic, and what I noticed was I could abort a cold and a flu in a day by catching it early, and rinsing, rinsing with the uh, 
saline and hypochlorite rinse. Now, that said, when I changed my diet and eliminated dairy, all that went away. I used to take three um, antihistamines per day, and now I'm taking zero. I haven't taken any for almost a year. So it's pretty, pretty amazing how diet will affect your health. Um, we went on the second day with Catherine uh, Gilliam talking about inflammation. And the reason COVID-19 is so dangerous for people with comorbidities, uh, for example, heart disease, is because when you read Amy's book, it will tell you that inflammation is the trigger. You can have plaque in your arteries, but if there's no inflammation, you're reducing your, your chance of having an event. So inflammation and dentistry, of course, is related. So this is how uh, Doug Thompson talked about wellness dentistry. And so by dentistry, helping people with their medical issues isn't that great. Now, I'm going to be a little controversial and, and say, okay, why should we help medicine treat their disease if dentists won't even treat caries disease? So many people that aren't doing um, caries management by risk assessment and then providing some kind of uh, chemical and products to treat the disease, and you're just managing it surgically, is similar to medicine ignoring the risk factors and waiting for uh, bypass surgery to happen on your heart. So that's not a good thing. Again, April uh, 22nd, Amy will be speaking. My colleague, Mike Nelson, is an expert in erosion and also in plant-based diet. I hope he talks a little bit about plant-based diet on the 24th. And of course, my uh, arm and my leg and my right hand, my left hand is Jeremy Horst an expert in silver diamine fluoride and many other things. He's a pediatric dentist. He's helped me uh, tremendously on many topics, and you'll see some of his slides today. Okay, enough of the uh, sidetracking. Let's talk about dentistry. So we know we've been doing GV Black, um, GV Black surgical model dentistry since the 1900s, and some would argue we're still doing it today because of the reimbursement model that we're in. In 2000, we started working with Canberra actually in the late 90s, and it started picking up steam in the 2000s, the last two decades, and some people call it the medical management of caries. The bottom line, no matter what you call it, it's the idea of treating the disease itself at the person, the patient level, rather than treating the tooth or the signs of the disease at the tooth level. And actually, until the ADA got involved in about 2018, we were treating this with only with fluoride and sealant. And I don't know why my slide's not transitioning. OK, there it goes. Sorry, it was just a delay. So we published the part one of non-restorative guidelines in 2018. We have part two and part three coming, one for prevention and one for restorative. And so this is, to me, a landmark because ADA realized their members want to know how to manage caries, even in the absence of high levels of evidence. And so they tackled that problem. And so the evidence-based dentistry group at the ADA is having these guidelines in process. So. COVID-19 shutdown. How are we going to treat this backlog of untreated decay? If dentistry is totally shut down, other than emergencies, um, what are we going to do? There's going to be this backlog. And just like we know in underserved areas, more drills are not the answer. So what I'm thinking is we're going to have to use interprofessional use of things like SDF, fluoride varnish. Um, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, that, well, if dentistry won't tackle it, we're going to need help from outside professionals, dental therapists, whatever. Um, and then today we'll talk about full mouth treatment with or without um, silver uh, modified atraumatic restorative techniques, the use of um, SDF, by the way. Okay, so today's objectives are how do we better use infection control and disinfection? How to reduce 
and exhaust the aerosol. How do we treat chemically, not surgically, when possible, using Canberra min, min, medical model carries and or minimally invasive dentistry? When we do need to do restorative techniques, how do we use different surgical techniques to remove uh, the carious part of the lesion? And could we use other instrumentation other than high-speed drills? And um, the last one is, how do you actually place silver diamine fluoride and glossonomer properly? And then I'll go over uh, the smart restoration last. Let me talk about these first two bullets and just knock them off right away. Um, all of us are aware what perfect infection control is. And we know that neither in medicine or in dentistry do we actually practice good, perfect infection control. Uh, the best example would be the operating room, which we are nowhere near um, as careful as we are in the operating room. So I would, I think COVID has changed this forever. We're going to be uh, super careful now with infection control and disinfectant, disinfection. And with, I want to kind of remind people, when I go to the medical doctor and I see them touching things they shouldn't be, you can do the same in dentistry. So pretend you're a patient and look at it that way. In fact, PPE should not be PPE. It should be PPPE. It should stand for patient and personal protective equipment. So from the patient standpoint, don't use good infection control to only protect yourself. We want to protect the patient. So little things like adjusting your eyewear or your, your mask, and it's no big deal. But, you know, people see that. I see that. I don't like it. My rule is if you wouldn't lick it, don't put it in my mouth. So if you're touching a pin and you wouldn't lick the pin, don't touch it with your gloves. And we all know this. It's just we've got to get better at it. Okay, that's bullet number one. Bullet number two, how do we reduce uh, aerosol? And if we create an aerosol, how do we exhaust it? So let's talk about that. So first, I'm no expert in aerosol, so I have to come up with a definition. The simple definition is it's a liquid or solid suspended in gas. Well, that makes sense. But isn't cigarette smoke? a solid suspended in gas? And the answer is, yeah, cigarette smoke is an aerosol. So if you think about it, how come we say it's respiratory, uh, respiratory droplets stay six feet away from somebody, right, social distancing? How come someone can smoke on the corner and I can smell the smoke across the street if the wind is blowing correctly? How come you can take a can of air freshener and spray a little spurt in a big, large room and smell it all the way across the room. So this is kind of scary. It's making me think, well, maybe this is not just six feet, and maybe that's why part of this uh, virulence we're having with spread is, is a problem. In fact, here's my grocery store in our local shopping, and we're lining up six feet apart because they're limiting the number of people that go into the store to buy groceries. And in fact, I saw on the news the other day a um, computer simulated model done at a university that showed COVID-19 particles could possibly move from, let's say you're shopping in aisle one, to drift all the way to aisle three. So, you know, I'm getting conflicting information. Six feet, two aisles, what do we do? Well. Thanks to Jeremy Horst, he shared this slide with me the other day showing that um, um, this old study in 19, uh, 1990, 1969 published aerosols, uh, a paper on aerosols. So let's, um, let's see what this says. And slide change. Got to go back to the button. Here we go. Okay. So this is a table that Jeremy's going to show you when he speaks. 
and I'm not going to talk about it, but I just wanted to make some personal comments um, that I won't get to get when, when to say when he's lecturing. So what this study does is measure aerosols um, by different dental procedures. And so what I just highlighted here is cavity preparation and drying air with the uh, three-way syringe. And it's about 58, 72, so rounded off 60 colony forming units per minute, whatever that means. So just keep it a relative number. That's my point here. Jeremy will teach you more about this study a little bit later. So let's compare cavity preparation and air drying to polishing teeth, which is 2,300 parts per minute, uh, colony forming units. And then washing your teeth with water spray, it jumps up to 37,000. That's incredible. And then brushing your teeth over on the left column is 2,500. So what is this telling us? Well, I take it with a grain of salt because back in the late 60s, were they using high speed with water spray? I remember going to dental school and having belt-driven hand pieces. So, um, you know, maybe it's different now. But let's just say this is a valid study. What it's saying to me is, let's, in the era of COVID, let's use less high-speed air, air cooling hand turbines and don't use the three-way syringe. So if we do that, how do we apply water and rinse without causing an aerosol? So what I suggest and my colleagues have suggested is using simple things that we've used in the past. What's wrong with rinsing and spitting in a cup? Remember those, all the operatories used to have a little spit sink? So you can ask your, ask your patient to rinse and spit in a paper cup. Or even better, you can isolate and then use a, a saturated um, cotton roll or better, a two-by-two two gauze and just have it sitting in a container of uh, water and just squeeze it on the tooth that you prepared like a sponge and then instead of uh, if you're in even don't have suction you can take a dry gauze and dab up the water so you can even use these techniques in the field when you're doing mission trip mission work okay and then the bottom box as far as polishing and brushing your teeth let's not use things that have bristles because things that have bristles will splatter a fine mist of aerosol, as you know, when you're brushing your teeth or whatever. So can we use a slower speed? I remember using those gear reduction slow speed hand pieces. If we took a, a profi cup with pumice and we wanted to clean a tooth, would a lower RPM with higher pressure be just as effective as a higher RPM? And my answer probably is yes, of course. So we need to modify certain techniques that we used based on clinical science. This is, again, an older study in JADA. It was the cover story, which usually means it's important, in 2004, basically studied aerosols in dentistry. And so let's look at a few of these tables. What the table one basically says is, OK, we had pneumonic plague, tuberculosis, influenza, Legionnaire's disease, and SARS, but now we got to add one more, COVID-19 to the list. And this one seems to be a nasty one as far as spread. OK. Um, table two basically says the worst of all in creating aerosol is ultrasonic or sonic cleaners. Well, we know that. Well, air polishing is not any better. It's equal to ultrasonic scalar. Same with the air water syringe. If you create a fine mist of water spray and splatter it on the tooth, it's creating an aerosol. Tooth preparation with air abrasion, this is kind of, uh, I'm sorry, tooth preparation with high-speed handpiece with water spray seemingly has less minimal airborne contamination if you use a rubber dam. I think you're still getting the aerosol. What they're saying is if you use a rubber dam, you're less likely to have bacteria in there to and other particles, but I'm not sure I trust this with COVID. And then tooth preparation with air abrasion is kind of an oxymoron to me because 
air abrasion, as we know, is the messiest of all tools that we have, yet this box says that it's unknown uh, with its bacterial contamination. But we do know it has extensive um, abrasive particles being released, so uh, I would not use air abrasion. Okay, table three talks about, okay, PPE, or in my case, PPPE. It filters out 60 to 95%, which we knew, if you're wearing the right mask and it's fitted properly. But again, the mask that we use in dentistry, I'm not quite, quite so sure. Um, how about pre-rinsing with chlorhexidine or some other antibacterial? As several of our lecturers said earlier, Chlorhexidine would not be my first choice. So I would use the hypochloride-based rinse or even an iodine-based rinse. And um, high-speed evacuation, well, of course we know high-speed evacuation is one of our best friends with reducing aerosol. The problem is we've been using high-speed evacuation for years, and we still have aerosol. So I'm going to show you later one more thing we might want to suggest using. And one last thing about um, high-speed evacuation is um, maybe things like the isolite unit will help because that creates a, a pretty strong uh, inward direction of the suction as well. High-efficiency uh, particulate air room filters and ultraviolet treatment of those ventilation systems. Basically, what these are talking about is a way to exhaust the air in the operatory so that it gets filtered properly and disinfected. And these are similar to what they have in operating rooms. Okay. But notice that these are only effective uh, or only used once the organisms are already in the room. So I was told today none of my videos will be working, but they will be working on the um, recordings that you're going to receive. So when you get a chance next week, um, go back and take a look at this. Kim actually sent this to me. It's called Dent AirVac. It's a company that makes a large commercial type air evacuation system. And I want you to think about uh, going into the laboratory, uh, dental laboratory, and they have those big cones. They look like, uh, you know, 12 inch diameter cones. And you turn the vacuum on and you trim your dye and all the dust goes into the, into the, uh, uh, suction device then gets cleared. Well, they make these for dentistry now. Think of it as a, uh, a shop vac that you put in front of the patient's uh, oral cavity, and as you're drilling, creating an aerosol, that gets sucked out of the room. Uh, I'm not saying that's the way we're going to go, but it's something to look at, at least as a solution to some of the aerosol problem. So again, uh, Jeremy directed me to the ADA where they have this um, summary of what constitutes a dental emergency. Well, we all know what they're going to say. Well, things uh, with respect to caries disease, a caries lesion that is causing pain. Um, and they're recommending treating it with silver diamine fluoride and glass ionomer cement. And so with minimal intervention. And so being a smart ass, what I'm going to ask is, OK, if this is good enough in, during a crisis situation, why are they not saying um, do a composite or do an amalgam? Okay? I think these have special properties. That is the, con uh, the reason I'm giving this lecture. So later on in the lecture, we're going to tell you why I don't use resin and why I use silver diamine fluoride and glass dimer cement and selective or partial caries removal. So if it's better in these crisis situations, why isn't it better all the time? Shouldn't we always be doing minimally invasive dentistry? OK, and then teeth that are um, resulting in pain, of course. Now, non-emergencies, we all know what a non-emergency is, cleaning or a prophy, something that is um, uh, asymptomatic or is um, just an aesthetic procedure. Jeremy will talk more about that slide later. Anyway, we knocked off the first two bullets. Let's now talk about uh, treating caries chemically and not surgically when possible. And when we do, 
we're going to learn when to treat surgically and when to treat chemically. So let's focus on this box right now. So everything starts by treating disease has to be done by using a risk assessment. Now, I'm pretty proud of this form because I recently devised it uh, for the dental therapy program in Alaska. And basically, I took our CDA-published uh, CAMBRA form, CAMBRA's risk assessment form, and reorganized it into a column format so that it's not only more visual, but it also automatically tells you the correct answer. And if you look at the column on the left, it says, the checked box furthest to the right determines the overall risk. So it doesn't matter how many boxes are checked. It matters which column is it checked in, okay? So let's focus your attention to the high-risk column because that's the easiest for me to explain. The first box says, if you have any active caries uh, lesion or radiolucency, whether it be cavitated or non-cavitated, in the last year, then you're automatically high risk because these are what we used to call disease, ind or we still do, called disease indicators. They're indicators you have the disease or have had it in the recent past. The second box is even in the absence of a caries lesion, other than, other, let's say the first box is not checked, you can still be high risk if you have an overwhelming high bacterial load. And so uh, if you, we used to measure it by culturing, I use uh, the ATP bioluminescence meter, and some people that don't have any devices or culturing mechanisms just rely on, hey, it's heavy plaque. It's covering your teeth. We've got to treat that with antibacterial. And that's the whole reason why this is in the high-risk high column. We want to be able to treat with antibacterials and a pH strategy if you have a high bacterial challenge. And even if the top two boxes are not checked, the third box, if you have three or more risk factors, you're still considered high risk. And then I went on to list the risk factors, which are basically destructive lifestyle habits like poor diet, frequency of eating, alcohol, recreational drugs, uh, poor oral hygiene, uh, wearing orthodontic appliances, susceptible pits and fissures, deep pits and fissures, and um, saliva reducing factors like medications, other systemic diseases that reduce saliva, and of course radiation treatment. And then it gives you a, an idea of when to recall the patient and when to take more bite wing radiographs at the bottom of the chart. Okay, no matter what risk assessment you use, you need a rubric to tell you what to treat with. So this is just an example of a treatment protocol that we used to use, use at University of Pacific. So low risk, you get oral hygiene instruction, dietary counseling, frequency of uh, eating um, information, and of course, um, fluoride, uh, recommended over-the-counter fluoride toothpaste. In moderate risk, you get everything in low risk plus two more things. If you're using sugar, let's try to use xylitol as a substitute. If you're using a mouth rinse, let's try to use a 0.05 over-the-counter fluoride mouth rinse. So with low risk, we got over-the-counter fluoride. With moderate risk, we got more over-the-counter fluoride. High risk, now we're going to use prescription fluoride and an antibacterial with a pH neutralization strategy. Extreme risk, by definition, is um, hyposalivation by observation and measurement. And so if you... Um, have less saliva, we want to supplement that saliva by helping its pH neutralization capability. You can use um, a spray from Carry Free. You can use baking soda mixed in a bottle of water, two teaspoons in a bottle of water, shake it up, but then you're stuck rinsing and spitting it out versus the Carry Free product is you spray it and you swallow it. There's other products on the market that neutralize acid, there's baking soda toothpaste, but we want you to be able to do this all day long. So toothpaste is not an option. So um, a, a breath spray like the Boost would work. Um, also, some type of calcium phosphate supplementation to help the saliva 
if you don't have enough saliva, you're not going to have enough calcium and phosphate needed for remineralization. Okay, so let's tackle this next question now. Many people are thinking, well, the ADA said calcium phosphate products don't have a lot of evidence showing it can arrest and reverse the carious lesion. Well, that's true, but I'm not using it to arrest and reverse the carious lesion. I'm using it to supplement saliva that I know is low. And if we had more sophisticated uh, laboratory tests for this, I would do them. If we had a test, chair side, that we can measure the calcium and phosphate and pH of a, of a patient sitting in our chair and give them real-time information, hey, your calcium and phosphate is low. That might mean your saliva is inadequate. Here, here's the suggestion. Use a, a, a calcium phosphate-containing product. Okay. That's Cambra in a nutshell. Moving on. Um, we have to discuss common terminology that we can use to track lesions at all sites, the occlusal, the approximal, the facial lingual, and have it consistent across the board. And then we need it using that terminology, how do we tell people when to treat chemically and when to treat surgically? So that's summarized in this um, another cover story, which of course means it's important, and yes, I was on the council then, so I got to be on this paper. Thank you to the ADA. And um, what we tackled first was the idea of activity. How many of us actually look to see if the lesion is active or inactive? Because if it's inactive, it's not demineralizing. If there's no demineralization, there's no disease. If there's no disease, there's no reason to treat it. So the first question is, how do I determine if a lesion is arrested? Well, as we know from silver diamine fluoride, is smooth, shiny, black, and hard. And this circle should actually um, extend to the row below it, the smooth, hard enamel and dentin. And active is described as matte, opaque, loss of luster. Uh, the tooth color is often white or just yellow for dentin. And then um, the surface is rough like sandpaper versus smooth like uh, an arrested white spot lesion. Okay, here's the famous chart. It looks rather complicated in the beginning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking because I could talk on it this for a couple of hours. Let's just keep it simple. This is a, 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 a chart, a diagram, that shows these four columns, uh, initial, I'm sorry, sound, initial, moderate, and advanced. Think of going to Costco. It's like buying a shirt. You get a choice, small, medium, or large. You don't get to choose the sleeve length, the, the collar width, um, the taper. You don't get to choose any of that. It's small, medium, and large. Okay. Now, the rows represent the different sites or location of carious lesions. The top row is the occlusal top row with the pictures, I'm sorry. The middle row with the pictures is the facial and lingual surface. And the bottom row with pictures are showing radiographs are the approximal site. And when we were writing this paper, we decided we looked at all the research internationally and nationally and said, you know what, in the United States, we don't have something to describe in minute detail what is going on on the pit and fissure surfaces. So internationally, we turned to the ADA and the group called the ACCMS, and we used this internationally accepted system called IC-DOS. And long story short, IC-DOS um, um, is a pic picture of what the number looks like. In other words, an IC-DOS zero looks like this, an IC-DOS one looks like this, a two looks like this, and you just compare the picture, picture to the number and you come up with the classification. And of course they go into great deal more detail. A one is the first visible sign of staining in the groove, and it has about a 9% chance of acid reaching the DEJ. And by the way, that's not cavitation, that's acid penetration. 
So as we know, acid diffuses much further than um, you think it would based on, it's not based on cavitation, it's based on how far the acid will um, penetrate. So 9% of the time it will penetrate an IC DOS worm. 50% uh, it will penetrate to the dentin an IC DOS 2. The definition of IC DOS 2 is it's a distinct visible sign. So if a 1 is a faint sign, a small, narrow, uh, brown, brown fissure, and you can't see it when the tooth is wet, so you have to dry an IC DOS 1 to see it. An IC DOS 2, you can see even if it's wet. It's like a Sharpie pen. I can see that. It's not a pencil. It's a Sharpie. It's a black, distinct fissure stain. A three is the first visible sign of enamel loss. You can see the chalky white. A four is the underlying shadow because the dentin has been demineralized. Doesn't mean it's cavitated, but the dentin can be demineralized and pick up exogenous stain. And then lastly, a five is a small hole, and I can see the dentin with my naked eye. And a six is a big hole, big cavitation, and I can see that with my naked eye as well. Now superimposed over that is the middle row you're seeing a, the same thing on a different surface. So an Isidos 1 could be an, a white spot that's been arrested. Uh, a 2 could be a white spot that's active. A 3 could be a microcavitation. The surface is a little bit rough, but it seems to be inactive. And a uh, Isidos 4 could be a microcavitation that's deeper and it's active. A, a Five and a six, of course, is full cavitation. And moving on to the last row are the radiographs. This is where we um, get people upset at us because studies show uh, the ideal state board D1 lesion that you see in the circle where the radiograph is just, the radiolucency is just penetrating the outer third of the dentin is very rarely cavitated. In fact, it says it's unlikely to have infected dentin which is the same way of saying it's not cavitated. Because if it's not cavitated, the bacteria are too big to fit through the enamel diffusion channels of intact enamel. And then, so what I want to use is this slide. Uh, this is what I use on my dental students. Um, if the person standing on the beach represents the size of the bacteria, the bacteria are much too big to fit through the grains of sand. The grains of sand are the enamel crystals or enamel rods, and is, they're filled with fluid. So if you take a pitcher of lemonade and you dump it on dry sand, that lemonade is going to soak very deep. Okay. In the case of uh, the mouth, it's basically going to diffuse into the tooth based on a concentration gradient. And that's why you see acid diffusing even if the tooth is not cavitated. So we don't need to drill the tooth unless it's fully cavitated because without bacteria in the dentin, we could treat all of it chemically. So think, most of us that are treating those D1, not most of me, but many people in practice that are treating a D1 uh, non-cavitated lesion on an approximal can automatically reduce their caries rate in their practice by at least a third by not cutting those and treating it chemically. Okay, um, and of course you'll be decreasing your aerosol by a third as well, not as in addition to doing what's right for the patient. What we're gonna focus now on is different surgical techniques, um, how we can use selective caries removal, hand instrumentation, and maybe even hand drill. I'm kind of monitoring the time now, so I'm gonna try to quicken the pace, because you should already know most of this already. What I want to focus on is not the studies itself, but tell you selective carriage removal has very high levels of evidence. We have um, critical reviews by the ADA. Uh, Van Thompson published this in the ADA journal, uh, a critical review that says um, complete carries removal, drilling till it's hard, is not necessary for carries management. By not drilling deep, you have less pulp exposures and you have more vital teeth. And so what the studies show 
is if you clean the perimeter of the lesion and then place a restoration, the margins are clean and sealed, the nutrient source, sugar, cannot get to any remaining bacteria that are in, 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 the, prep, in the cavity preparation. So courtesy of he and no, he published these pictures, and the middle picture on the right is showing infected dentin. It's defined by Edwina Kidd as wet and soft. If you take a paper point and dab it in there, liquid would fill uh, the paper point. On the bottom picture is affected dentin. That's leathery dentin. It can be described by Edwina Kidd's research as dry and soft. If you took a spoon and stood on it and pressed hard, yeah, you could dig some more out but it's minimally infected. There's no bacteria in there, so you don't have to remove it. And over time, affected dentin will become hard and remineralized. Okay, um, this is an introduction uh, because I found this on a, our school website on the history of a handpiece. I'm just gonna read it to you real quick. Until the mid-19th centuries, dental cavities were prepared very slowly. Long, slender burrs were often simply twirled before between your fingers and your thumb to remove decay. Or they could be vigorously spun, spun around with a vigorous back and forth sawing motion. Uh, tedious nuisance uh, of excavation provoked shortcuts. Holes were sometimes filled just with a slug of uh, a plug of gutta percha or lead, uh, skipping the caries removal altogether. And so these concepts I'm presenting to you are not new. They've been around since the 19th century. This is Jerry uh, uh, Biakerman, and he uh, invented these hand drills. He took a burr and epoxied them into a uh, hand instrument, like a mirror handle. And actually, they're available online now. Uh, you don't have to use epoxy. They're in removable. You can put a burr in. It's like an X-Acto knife handle. And if you email me, I'll get you Jerry's uh, information as, as well. Jerry, by the way, is a dental therapist. So let's look at glass dianomer as just a quick review on why I use glass dianomer, not resin, to treat carriers chemically. Obviously, it's because of the fluoride, and obviously it has high levels of evidence of fluoride release um, and chemical fusion to the uh, tooth structure itself. This is he and those famous um, electron micrograph showing uh, the diffusion of ions, the ionic exchange that happens when you bond uh, glass ionomer on the right to enamel on the left. And actually, he proved using electron probe microanalysis that this zone is called internal remineralization. It's acid resistant. And in fact, that layer is so strong, when you stress it in the laboratory, the material itself, the glass ionomer, will break before the fusion to the tooth breaks. And of course, we know that because it's um, remineralization. This is Graham Milicic um, published article showing that it happens in dentin as well as in enamel. And so I want to review these filling instructions rather quickly. Um, the first step that nobody does that I keep pounding on is glass ionomer does not bond to plaque or pellicle. So you got to remove the plaque or pellicle before you start using glass ionomer, because glass ionomer is going to create a flash outside your preparation. And flash with resin is bad. Flash with glass ionomer is good, because once you clean the surface, it's chemically fused and it's going to remineralize the lesion. In fact, he and No uses, used the concept, uh, introduced me to the concept two decades ago what's called surface protection. Why do you need to restore it at all? If you have a, a, a patient that can't tolerate uh, drilling or anesthetic, just cover it with glass ionomer and it will remineralize. Okay, second, second step, uh, partial caries removal, selective caries removal. Just clean the margins. Don't dig deep so that you're gonna hit the pulp. Number three, condition using polyacrylic acid. This is no longer an optional step in the manufacturer's instructions. It's a mandatory step. And we mentioned uh, ways to minif minimize aerosol by using suction devices and cotton instead of your air water syringe. 
Um, then you go ahead and place your band and wedge. Of course, uh, I cleaned it and conditioned it before the band and wedge because if you place the band and wedge first, now you can't clean it and you can't use a polyacrylic acid because the graphite ionomer is liquid and it's going to get outside the band. Uh, don't limit your working time by heating up the capsule. People hold that capsule in their hand and they wonder why they can't get it in the tooth in time. Okay, and then the rest of the instructions are pretty much um, as per manufacturer's instructions. With the exception of number seven, I don't like to tell people to carve the glass ionomer. I tell them, think of it as cementing a crown. Don't cement the crown with cement and jiggle it after 30 seconds. You, you want to get it on quickly and let the cement crosslink. And so if you're carving it after 30 seconds, you're possibly breaking the crosslinking. And then never let the glass ionomer dry out. Um, I'm going to skip these. These are visual uh, images of what I just went over. I just want to show you I did a crown with glass ionomer, and it was the wrong shade. Don't knock me for that. Um, the wrong shade was because this is Fuji Forte a year and a half before I could get it in the United States and I smuggled it out of Belgium. And what I found was um, it didn't fall out. It didn't dissolve. It didn't break under occlusal forces. If you see on the facial, I did ditch it with the rubber cup. And so if you're polishing with rubber cups, don't press on it. You have to use the outside diameter of the cup to polish because glass ionomer is soft. Think of polishing um, something wet like a, uh, cheddar cheese. You wouldn't use that edge of the cup, uh, cup, and dig it into uh, cheddar cheese. It's soft. Okay. Here's the restoration under occlusion. Here's the incorrect shade showing my uh, crude attempts at uh, anatomy. My anatomy is much better now. Um, facial and lingual view showing it's basically a three-quarter crown with one marginal ridge. I did no drilling on the teeth. The crown lasted one month, three months, six months, and after six months, there was no difference between immediate post-op and six months. Okay, I gotta finish up. On the website, when you get the recording, you'll see me hitting this with a hammer. Uh, this is a tooth that I did a crown on uh, in the lab, and I hit it in the hammer, and the tooth broke before the glass ionomer broke. Think of hitting a, a ceramic crown with a hammer it's going to break the ceramic crown. Why didn't the glass ionomer break? And then Jeremy is going to talk about silver diamine fluoride. And I want to shout out to all people on the slide. I won't have time to talk about you. But uh, thanks for helping me learn more about silver diamine fluoride and providing slides for me. Um, high levels of evidence, because ADA put out guidelines. How to place it, I'm going to let glass, um, Jeremy cover this. I just want you to know that the steps are non-aerosol. Don't dry with the air. If you don't have to, you can use gauze. Uh, use your suction device, your high-speed suction to dry the tooth. Uh, you could rinse with uh, sponging water on with cotton or use the rinse and spit method. Um, Jeremy will show you the slide about how deep it penetrates uh, the dental tubules, allowing you to do restorations with no anesthesia. And finishing up with SMART, and then I'm done. Sorry for rushing. Um, but I did want to cover SMART because um, it's a combination of um, partial caries removal, selective caries removal, um, uh, silver diamine fluoride, and glass ionomer using the ART technique. And that's why we call it SMART. Now, let me just cover when you would use SMART. Because if you can get clean margins, why wouldn't you just use glass ionomer alone? So the first bullet says, yes, you can. You don't need silver diamine fluoride. The second bullet says, well, the reverse is also true. You can use silver diamine fluoride and never restore it, as per ADA guidelines. The third bullet is, well, if I want to do both, why don't you arrest it first, let the let the silver diamine fluoride wash away from the surface so that I won't have to deal with 
staining of my restoration, followed by a glossonomer restoration. And you could argue, you, if you use that technique, you can use composite as well. I use glossonomer for its remineralizing underneath. The last bullet is the smart same-day restoration. And how do we do this without violating manufacturer's instructions? The answer is place the silver diamine slide first, then using selective carriage removal, take a hand instrument or hand drill and clean the perimeter of the lesion, removing the silver diamine fluoride, and then place your glass anomer as for manufacturer's instructions. So no surprise, this doesn't violate any of the high levels of evidence that presented, were presented for each of these techniques separately. Okay? There's no silver diamine fluoride on the margin. Steve Duffin and others uh, authored this book on SMART. Uh, we have many of us contribute chapters to this, so I recommend you go check it out online because you're going to get way more than I just introduced you to uh, during this one-hour presentation. So I'm pretty much done. I'm just going to give you a pictorial diagram of the steps of doing um, a same-day SMART. Dry, apply the SDF, never use a cord because you will burn the gum, and then you do selective carry removal using the two millimeter rule. And by the way, when there's no enamel, you only go one millimeter into the D dentin. So this is a resident that cleaned very well. You can see the silver diamine fluoride in the deeper areas. If you spoon that out, you'll hit the pulp. So don't do that. And then restore it. And we're pretty much done. Am I two minutes over? So hey, I'm going to turn it job. over back to you. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Young. Um, that was amazing content that you covered. And we have some questions coming in. I um, everyone keep keep those questions coming. First, I'm going to see if Dr. Cooch, do you have any anything to add or anything to say? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Nicole. I, I took a whole page of notes here, Doug. Very <laughs> well done, by the way. Uh, you, you covered a lot of material in the hour and, and a lot of really, really good, important material. Um, and I think you're, you're asking questions and challenging us as a profession in a direction that right now we need to be challenged in and we need to think about. Um, you talked about the aerosol. I just want to cover that for just a second. Um, those people who know me well know that back in the early 1990s, uh, my first company I developed was for air abrasion. And we also developed a uh, HEPA filter, you know, chair-side vacuum system that looks like the dent airbag uh, at that time to capture the particles from the air abrasions we were using in the mouth because that was the dust was quite an issue in the operatory. Uh, but one of the things that I, I want to bring up is um, all of the other air abrasion devices on the market were a continuous flow, and we'd actually had developed a patented and unique pulse unit. And so you got these little pulses of air, and the interesting thing about it, or unique thing about it, was you could actually remove a, an amalgam restoration, an old amalgam restoration with air abrasion. And so I asked the question, because I didn't know, uh, is that safe? Like how much mercury vapor does that create by, you know, versus a handpiece? And so I actually hired an industrial hygienist who came into my practice for a week and set up all these sensors all over the office. And I got educated on mercury vapor, and but on aerosols. You could, Doug, as you were talking about the, the cigarette smoke across the street or the, you know, air freshener across a 40-foot room, um, when we start talking about aerosols, there were some real interesting things that came out of that study. Number one, it turned out it was safe. Um, I'm reciting from memory. I had this paper in my hand like two weeks ago. I hadn't looked at it in 20 years. But um, this study, it was interesting. The OSHA limit for exposure to mercury vapor, if, if I'm correct from memory, it was like 80 parts per million for eight continuous hours was like the OSHA allowable limit. And in, a, in my dental office, and, I, and one thing you need to know is I have not placed an amalgam restoration since 1983. So I wasn't mixing any and placing any. All I was doing was removing old amalgams. And the background mercury exposure in my office all the time ran between 7 and 10 parts per million, like all the time. That was in my office. 
And when I would use a high-speed handpiece with water spray and high-volume evacuation and take out an amalgam restoration, immediately within my zone and the assistant zone of the patient's mouth, um, and it doesn't matter if you got a, a rubber dam on, I mean, this is coming out of the restoration itself. Within 12 to 16 inches, it peaked immediately at like 80 parts per million. And interestingly enough, then over a period of, you know, maybe 15 minutes in my operatory, that went back down to 7 to 10 parts per million. So I was hitting the maximum allowable limit, but only just for, you know, for the duration of the time that I was taking the restoration out. It was very comparable when I used air abrasion. It did the same thing. Got to about 80 parts per million, hung around in the op operatory for about 15 minutes, and then it went back to this baseline of 7 to 10. Now, this is the most interesting part of this whole deal. And this is what I think we really need to be thinking about this right now, is within five minutes of the time that I started removing that restoration in my operatory, within five minutes, the mercury vapor level throughout the entire office, the waiting room, the front office, the restroom, the entire office peaked at 80 parts per million within five minutes. So what that tells you is that aerosol, that mercury vapor that I was generating my operatory because of our, you know, high vac, you know, your HVAC system, your heating and, and air conditioning system in your office, spread it throughout the entire office within five minutes. So I think we like to think of, well, the waiting room is a safe place to be, uh, the gals at the, you know, the people at the front desk aren't really exposed to anything, and, and the, the reality is, now, this was mercury vapor, but they were exposed to it just like I was. And I was rather shocked by that. And, of course, you know, you kind of, well, nobody's going to dive. You know, we were certainly way below the OSHA allowable limits. You know, so being aware of that didn't really send off any alarms. The thing that I think back to now is when we generate an aerosol with a high-speed handpiece, everybody in the office is, is exposed to it and within like five minutes of the time that you started generating it. So um, the thing about those high volume evacuations and that there's three systems on the market that I'm aware of at the moment. One is Dent Airvac, uh, the other is Sentry Air Systems, and the other is Dental Safety Solutions. And those are HEPA vacs, and a HEPA vacuum will uh, eliminate particles, 99.97% of particles down to 0.3 microns um, successfully. And so you need about, chair-side, I mean, what I learned in the 90s was you needed about 400 cubic feet per minute running through that HEPA vac, and you could pull it right up next to the patient's mouth, just get it as close to the mouth as possible. So I think as we go forward thinking about the exposure of COVID, and this isn't going away, like, we're going to eventually get a vaccine, but, this, but again, we're having these pandemics with these aerosol respiratory, you know, viruses every few years. This is something I think as a profession we need to consider to creating safety for both ourselves and our staff and then also for our patients, but to start looking at how do we control that and, and what do we do with it. Uh, I well, think certainly a, a, a good approach, Doug, would be to use a, an iodine or a, or a sodium hypochlorite rinse or a swab on the teeth, isolate with rubber dam, use high volume evacuation, and then certainly we should be maybe looking at these HEPA vacuums. Yep, for sure. I would look into that isolate suction device as well. What's scary, Kim, yeah. is most of these studies are showing an aerosol can stay aerosol for 30 minutes. In fact, Dr. Alan Wong told me in the operating room currently for COVID, their anesthesiologists are evacuating the room for 20 minutes after they've intubated the patient before they allow the surgeon into the room. And that's with a ventilated room. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is just something that we've got an exposure to. And, you know, we've been rather nonchalant and complacent about it because it hasn't really been a risk for all of us. But it's certainly something I think it's a topic that as we all anticipate going back to work and doing non-urgent procedures that require the use of, a, of an aerosol, um, how do we protect ourselves and protect our patients? So I think that's a conversation. I know Jeremy's going to talk about that, but I think that's certainly weighing on everybody's minds. 
Great. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I'm going to have to jump in here for time. Yep, go um, ahead. And I want to get some of these good questions that have been coming in. <laughs> so. And by the, um, and by the way, I'll yeah. stay as long as possible if people have to go fine, but I'm willing to stay as long as possible for the questions. Yes, definitely. People can um, sign off if they have, have to um, go get something else, and this will be recorded so they can listen to it after. So Kenneth asked, would you consider placing silver nitrate before placing a glass ionomer filling? Um, why not use silver diamine fluoride? Um, we used silver nitrate based on Steve Duffin's work for many, many years. Um, but if you're using it for restoration, um, it will probably be antibacterial. There's no fluoride in it um, for the remineralization. But it's, it's just added insurance. So if you don't have silver diamine fluoride, I guess you could use silver nitrate as well. Okay. Um, and then Cheryl asked, what brand of glass ionomer do you use? Um, there's many good brands of glass ionomers out there. I think the main player, um, especially um, at our school, um, is GC America. So we're using um, exclusively the um, Fuji 9 Extra for aesthetic restorations because it's more translucent. The Fuji Forte for strong, stronger posterior restorations. And I like the Fuji Triage for sealant because it's more liquid. And by the way, the Fuji 9 Extra is plenty strong. When you look at the video with the hammer, that's Fuji 9. So um, if you only had to choose one, I would choose the Fuji 9 Extra. If you want to block out, block out glass ion, I mean silver diamine fluoride, I would use the Fuji Forte because it's more opaque. Awesome. Um, and then John asks, can you give us a rinse recipe for the 0.2% bleach and proboiodine? Um, for what use? Did they say for? Canberra for Carrie's for, disease for management. Rinse. Okay, so okay, so I meant I mentioned it for the nasal rinse, which I'm not suggesting people do. I just told you that because I was so desperate not to get in the hospital with pneumonia. Um, I suppose that's an area that should have research done because it worked just, so effectively he just had for me. Rinse for treatment. Yeah, so let's talk about it for Carrie's disease treatment. So um, I would recommend the carry-free CTX4 treatment rinse. I don't recommend that you try to mix it yourself, even though uh, I think uh, Jordan Slots recommend, you know, gave you a recipe. I think there's liability issues. Carry-free is a pharmaceutical grade manufacturer that will put the right stuff in the bottle correctly. So I don't think you should open yourself up to mixing your own. I use it um, differently depending on motivational interviewing with the patient. But the general rule of thumb is I hit it hard for one bottle, which is about 22, 23 days. I tell the patient, rinse once a day for one minute. And what I've learned, if you can brush your teeth at the same time, I use a mechanical brush. I insert it in my mouth and close my lips over it so I don't splatter because I'll get bleach on my clothes and ruin them in the bathroom. So I close my lips over my brush and I brush my teeth. And try it yourself. You'll never have a cleaner mouth. Um, and then after the bottle is gone, I have them back for a uh, post-op ATP bioluminescence reading, and I compare the pre-op to the post-op. And I will guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time it will go down by significant amount. And the reason I'm telling you this is the ATP meter is a motivational tool for the patient, dentist, and the staff. It shows them it, they're getting better. It's like me and Amy with my labs. She's testing me to see my cholesterol is getting better. My inflammation numbers are down. So it gives me incentive to keep trying to keep better, to try other products. And guess what? When they get better, they're going to 
they're going to refer so many patients to your office. It's just like me. Every place I go, I tell people about Amy Donine, the Bale Donine technique, because if I could help 80% of the people I talk to, I'm going to do it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so just a couple more. Kim, I know you mentioned, or Dr. Gooch, about what your recommendations were um, to protect yourselves when you are going back to work. Could you just maybe both of you touch on your recommendations for specific PPE when returning to work to protect yourself and other patients, if you have any suggestions? Well, I think, Kim, you know, pretty, go ahead. Go, ahead. go Kim. Um, Obviously, as the PPE equipment is available to us, uh, certainly, uh, you know, you got to wear a mask and gloves and protect your eyewear. Make sure that your mask is, is properly fitted to your face. Like if you're wearing a mask and you got big gaps around over the bridge of your nose and whatever, uh, that's absolutely worthless in terms of, you know, protecting you. Um, and then I think the more that you can avoid using an aerosol, the more that you can, like Doug was talking about, uh, using a rubber dam routinely, maybe, you know, rinsing, pre-rinse with, you know, with uh, carry-free treatment rinse, um, rubber dam, high volume evacuation, you know, and then again, just being real conscientious about cleaning all the surfaces in the room. You know, these respiratory diseases, particularly this COVID, I think everybody's all, you know, they, they wear a mask, at least the public is wearing a mask, and they all think that they're protected and everything's good. Uh, and the most likely route of transmission is going to be them picking this up on the surface with their hand and then taking their hand to their nose or their eye or their mouth. And that's how most colds are transmitted as, as well. So I think just being real conscientious about that, it's like flu season, uh, <laughs> you know. You know, every year during flu season, I, I, I keep the hand sanitizer in my truck, right? So that's the first thing I do every time I get in my vehicle is sanitize my hands. So I think we need to be aware of that. And, um, and also just, you know, helping your patients understand that you're doing, you know, providing extra precaution to protect them as well. Doug, can you want to add to that? Um, not, not anything more than I've already said. I, basically that yeah. if these minimally invasive techniques we discussed today are good in a crisis, why wouldn't they be good every day? Great. Thank you both. So I'm going to just go over our little housekeeping items to wrap everything up. So um, Facebook, just reminding you, if you haven't already joined our Facebook group, please consider doing so. After this has ended, you'll be directed to the link where you can join. It's a great opportunity to continue networking with your peers and speakers. We also will be posting the recordings in the group daily with some additional bonus content. Recordings, if you're one of those that doesn't have Facebook, don't worry, we've got you covered. We'll be sending the recording later today via email with the CE info. And for CE, once you complete the quiz and evaluation form, you'll get your certificate within a couple weeks. If you have questions that didn't get answered, don't hesitate. Again, to, like Dr. Young mentioned, you can reach out to him directly. He left his contact information um, but I'll read it to you again. His email is dyoung at pacific.edu. And then here's a quick glance at the next couple sessions we have coming up this week. So Thursday, we'll have internationally recognized speaker and hygienist Patty DeGangi discussing why and how teledentistry is an opportunity both in the short term and the long term. Friday, we'll be wrapping up the week with hygienist Michelle Hudson. She is going to be talking about oral pathogens and their key role in heart health. These are two powerhouse hygienists you absolutely can't miss. They both have so much life-saving and important information to share with you. Um, last but not least, I just want to thank you guys again, all of the attendees, for being with us today. We hope this hour each day continues to bring you joy. We appreciate your support because we wouldn't be able to be doing this without you. Um, so that takes care of everything on my end. Dr. Cooch and Dr. Young. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And, and, and Doug, thank you so much for being our presenter today. And I just want everybody to stay optimistic, stay positive, and stay safe. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.